Uh, We turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 and looking primarily at the seventh verse uh, as we think together of our identity. And identity is a key concept and word in our time and society today, but perhaps it has always been a concern for human beings to understand who we are, what our place is within this vast universe, what our role is among the millions and billions of people within this planet. Certainly the compilers of our shorter catechism 400 years ago recognized the importance of such questions by addressing it at the very beginning of their catechism. I don't really know who I am. One writer says, I don't really know my purpose in life. She writes, I don't know why I am here. Gabby Logan, the TV sports presenter, has written. These are not the words of a teenager seeking their place and purpose in life, but of a woman who has just turned 50. They are not the words of someone who has had little success in life, but of someone who's been very successful in terms of this world. Not the words of someone who is little known, lonely, or unloved, but the words of someone who is well-known and well-liked. Yet, she, like many others in our workplace, in our community, in our families, are searching and wrestling with this question of identity. I remember, and perhaps You do as well as a teenager wrestling with this question. The question would come to me, I I recall, usually in the mornings as I brushed my teeth preparing for another day at school. And I remember wondering what my role, what my purpose is in this world as I grew and developed. And I remember the answer that would always come to my mind, though I didn't fully understand its depth was the answer to the first question in the shorter catechism. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That answer, while I didn't fully understand it, assured me that there was a real purpose, a significance for our life. Maybe you are wrestling with this issue, this question today. Why are you here in this world? What is your role, your purpose? Who are you? And here in this second foundational issue that we're thinking of right at the very start of the Bible, this issue is addressed and a wonderful answer is given to us that that we can carry with us into our life and experience. We here encounter for the first time in the Bible and in the book of Genesis, a phrase that is repeated in the, in the fourth verse. This is the account of. It will appear 11 times in the book of Genesis. And it, it, it's a critical phrase, a phrase connected to a shift, a change of focus by the writer. But it's usually indicating the descendants of someone. So chapter 5, verse 1, the generations of Adam. This is the account of the generations of Adam. But in verse 4 of Genesis 2, it is used in a different way. The source is not a person, as it is in the other times it's used, but the heavens and the earth. This is the account of the heavens and the earth. And this is critical for us as we come to study our identity. Here is a passage which is asserting the supremacy, the climax of the creation of God. In chapter 1, we we know it it is a, a chapter devoted to an account of God creating the world. The six days of creation there. But here the second chapter goes back over that work of creation and focuses in on one aspect of that creation, the creation of woman and of man. 
This is the climax. This is the significance of this repeated phrase throughout Genesis in this place. This is the account of. This is the climax of the creation. This is what the creation of God produced. Mankind made at the end of the creation week, made by God. Just as a celebrity will arrive at a a major event at last and usually late, so here is, is mankind, man and woman, the account of who they are, their purpose, their role within this planet earth and the vast universe which God has made been set out for us and explained to us. So these chapters have rightly been considered as foundational for our understanding not only of creation but of ourselves and of our world. Going back to the beginning, we're examining these basic building blocks for our lives and to understand living in the 21st century rather than starting with today, starting with a blank page, trying to work it all out for ourselves. We're taking the approach that God knows best and that right at the very beginning of the Bible, we are informed about how to live centuries later. And so we're looking at these foundations for living. Companies, churches have mission statements. They seek to distill and clarify and crystallize in their minds, the minds of the leaders and the minds of their employees, what their company is about, what their aims, their purpose, their role is within the business world. And here in these early chapters of Genesis has been crystallized for us foundations for living. And in particular this evening, our identity. Who are we? What is our role? What is our purpose? How are we to understand ourselves? And here we have the answer in this second chapter. We'll consider the Sabbath and its importance for us in our life and how to keep the Sabbath. We thought of work this morning. We'll think of covenant and the importance of covenant in our life. We'll think of marriage. We'll think of grace. We'll think of sin. Foundations for living in the 21st century. So we come then, uh, moving away from Eden, as you can see here, it's, it's unclear uh, where Eden was, but this will be a focus uh, in the top there, in the, in the side there. Uh, there are a range of places from the, the details given in Genesis uh, where, where scholars have suggested uh, Eden is. But we're thinking then uh, of our identity, and there's three principles that we want to, to grasp here this evening, and, and the youngest child uh, could manage to, to go away with those and, and allow those, by God's blessing, to shape their life. And those of us who are older, it's an opportunity for us to, to re-understand ourselves and to, to give ourselves uh, to these principles of, of how we live our life. We are made by God. We are made like God. We are made for God. This is our identity. And this is the identity of every human being, Christian or non-Christian, made by God, made like God, made for God. So let's uh, see from the text uh, these these principles this evening. First of all, we are made by God. And our reading in 2.7 helps us uh, with this. This verse and the chapters make clear that we did not evolve from the lower creation, did we? As evolution claims. But we were made by God. 2 verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God is depicted as an artisan 
is sculpting man, Adam. And then in 22, chapter 2, verse 22, he's considered as a builder constructing the woman. Man, woman, made by God. He gives personal attention. He gives care in making the first man, the first woman, reflecting the deliberation. You remember that we read in chapter 1, 26 and 27, God speaking within the Trinity, let us make man in our image. The word formed in 2.7 is used of potter's activity by the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 18. Here is God forming the body of man with skill, with care, with, with contact, with power, molding, shaping, not allowing the clay to, to just evolve or, or come to its own design and position, but the pressure on the clay, shaping it with skill, care, detail, attention. He's formed the man from the dust of the ground. The dust it can refer to the raw materials uh, that, that are, are, are loosely uh, around there or, or, or powder uh, that, that is pulverized. There's a range of understandings uh, of dust. But what it's emphasizing, the body of man being made from the ground. It does speak of fragility. But, but the main connection is that God takes uh, this matter and he forms it into a body. God is the author, the creator, the maker of man. But he doesn't just make his, his body, does he? Verse 7 emphasizes he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In the creation account, you'll be aware that the, the plants then, they, they, they grow, but it doesn't speak of them as, as breathing. In the creation account, it speaks of animals and humans as having the breath of life. They breathe, they live, they are given life by God. But the, the account of, of mankind being given life is, is detailed, is slow, and, and is emphasizing the, the elevated nature that human life possesses. Verse 7, this is how mankind received that life, that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. One writer comments, breathed is warmly personal, with the face-to-face -face intimacy of a kiss, and the significance that this was giving as well as making and self-giving at that. Here is God forming uh, the body uh, of the first man and then breathing from, from his breath, from his life into that, that formless form and, and making that person, Adam, a living soul. And we understand that the word breath, it's, it's in the plural, and it includes more than, than the, the physical life, than the breathing of the body. It, there is a, a multiplicity of, of life that is coming into the body of Adam at this time. There is the physical life. There is also the soul being formed and instilled into the body of this first human being. Made by God. We love turning over a wooden plate, a wooden mug, a wooden bowl, a wooden chair, table, stool, and reading on the back of it, handcrafted in Dorset. Immediately we have a fresh appreciation of the item, the skill of the artisan. We look at the seams and the curves with increasing wonder. It's not made in China, it's handcrafted in Dorset. And so God, incredibly, has made each one of us. And this is the, the wonderful thing for us to, to understand that, that what was true of, 
of Adam here at the beginning is true of each of us. Not only did God make Adam's body and soul, but for each one of us, God also has made our body and our soul. In Psalm 139, you remember the psalmist, uh, hundreds of years later, uh, writes, God, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Here is the psalmist recognizing uh, that beyond all things, God was involved in forming his body. And we know from other parts of Scripture that, that, that God, we, we believe, is the, the creator of a fresh soul for every human being and, and, and infuses that soul into the, the, the person at the very moment of conception. This is the first element of our identity. We are made by God. And as the psalmist reflects on this, on God's involvement at the very beginning of his existence, he, he says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And this should be our response as we reflect on God not only forming Eve, not only forming Adam at the very beginning, but forming us as well. His fingerprint is on our body, is on our soul. We are made by God, and we should praise him. Think of your souls. Think of the properties of your soul. And this has been analyzed and discussed and talked about for centuries. What are the properties of our souls? The basic elements are our intellect, our emotions, our will. That we can understand, that we can love, that we can choose. Imagine if we couldn't do one of those things, how different we would be. And yet God in his wisdom and goodness has made us in this incredible way. Think of our bodies. Think of the senses that we possess, of smell and touch and taste and seeing and hearing. Imagine being absent or, or one of these being absent from us, how different our life, our world would be. As we reflect on being made by God, our soul, our body, like the psalmist, we are to say, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Evolution is robbing God of the praise that is due to him. It is robbing that, that assertion that he is creator and maker of each one of us. That, that he formed us in the beginning. That he is involved in our lives at this time. Perhaps at times we are hurt. When we do not deserve or receive the praise that we believe we deserve. That some work which we have performed is, is unnoticed, is unappreciated. And it's worse when that, that action, that, that good action, is ascribed to someone else. How much more does God deserve our praise, our thanks, our worship for how he has made us? Here is the first aspect of our identity. We are made by God. Let it sink into our life and let us respond in a whole range of ways to that. Secondly, we are made like God in verses 5 and 6 of this chapter. In chapter 1, man and woman are described as we read as being made in the image and likeness of God. And one aspect of that image is that God gave mankind dominion over all the earth. The Lord is king over all the world and he has made Adam and Eve in his image by making them and us stewards of this earth, rulers over the Lord creation. And this is a key part of who we are. What is our role within this world? What is our place in this universe? One element of that answer is we are stewards of God's creation reflecting his work, his kingship 
over all things. And this point is emphasized in verses 5 and 6. And this, there's, there's this wonderful build-up uh, to, to man being created in verse 7. You see how the, the writer describes the things that are not there. Verse 5. There was no bush in the field. There was no small plant of the field. Here was a world where there was land, where there was ground, where there was verdure, where there was growth, where there were rivers, where there was a mist. The irrigation was there. The potential was there. But there was no man to steward it. There was no king to rule over it. There was no one to care for it, to nourish it, to advance it, to cultivate it. Then, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. This was his role. This was the position given to humanity to be the steward of this land which was uncultivated, where there was no bush, where there was no small plant, because there was no man or woman to steward the earth. Ard's Department of Health have a branch entitled the Environmental Health Group or Department. They care for the air quality of this vicinity, for the noise issues which arise, for water and sanitation problems, for food safety. They have a care for the environment. And that care for our environment is a dominant issue within our world. Greenpeace and other groups are caring for the environment around us. And their care and interest is intriguing. Not always with the best motives, not always with pure motives. Yet there is a concern and much discussion among parties, among governments for our world. Deborah Meaden of Dragon's Den takes great care to invest in companies that are environmentally friendly in the materials which they use in, in producing products and in the production methods which they adopt. She wants everything to be environmentally friendly. But when she was asked if she was religious, she replied, I am an atheist. And this is the mix within our fallen humanity. There are the remnants of the image of God within us. This appointing of mankind to reflect God's kingly work in heaven, in mankind that we are kings and queens on this earth, stewards of the environment, and yet sin has marred our rule, our dominion, our reflection of being made like God's. Calvin likened it to a ruined castle, didn't he? We can see traces of the image of God in man and woman, but sin has marred much of the beauty and glory of it. And so it is in relation to this aspect of caring for the environment. There are traces of being made in God's image, of this dominion given to Adam and Eve to steward the creation. But it's a mix with much that's fallen and misdirected and wrong. Our prominent interest and care is to be for the spiritual needs of our world and our community and our families and our life and our peninsula. But we're not to ignore the stewardship of creation beside us here. Made by God, made like God. And thirdly, we are made for God. And this is brought out uh, by the title of God, uh, which begins to be used in verse 4 of chapter 2. In the day that the Lord God made the earth. And, and this, this, is, this is a, a really intentional point it's a really important point uh, and a fundamental point in our answer that we are made for God you see in chapter 1 uh, to chapter 2 verse 3 the title used of God is the title God just God every time the almighty is mentioned in chapter 1 to chapter 2 verse 3 
The title God is used. But from 2 verse 4 to the end of chapter 3, the title Lord God is used. And this is obviously intentional and has a message for us 20 times. This new title of the Almighty is employed, Lord God. God emphasizes his power, the word Elohim, his might, he's the creator. And this is why in the creation account in chapter 1 to 2 verse 3, God is emphasized. He is powerful. He is mighty in what he does. But but here in this account of, of mankind, of woman being made, this new dimension of God, this new title of God is is introduced. He's the Lord God. He is powerful. He is mighty. But there's more to this, this supreme being than his power and his strength. He is also the Lord. A title that we know is connected with God's covenant of grace used much in Exodus and Deuteronomy A title connected to his love, his mercy, his fellowship with his people. And this raises the question then, what is the significance of this combination of titles in God in chapter 2 verse 4 to the end of chapter 3? What is the writer intending by this change in title of God that he now uses? And it's got to be. That here that the writer is portraying the truth that not only are we made by God, made by his power and his might and his wisdom, but that we are made for God, for the God of love, for the God of covenant, for the God who wants a relationship with his creatures, a loving communion and fellowship between the almighty creator and the creation that he has made. Significantly in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3, as we'll see when it records the fall of mankind, the temptation by the devil, the author reverts principally to the use of the title God indicating the the, the impact that this temptation and disobedience is having on the relationship between the Almighty and his creatures. But the predominant use throughout the second chapter of this new title of God, Lord God, emphasizes that we are made for God, that he is not aloof that he is not just an almighty, powerful being, but that he, the creator God, desires fellowship and love and communion and relationship with his creatures. We are made like God, yes. We are made by God, yes. But we are also made for God. DIYers, the DIYers among you know that for every job, There is a tool that we can't just take a hammer to every job. Sometimes we need the screwdriver. Sometimes we might need the saw. There is a wrong tool that we can take to try and do another job. It was not made for that role. Mankind has been made for God. For a relationship with God. And in every non-Christian, there is a gaping hole at the center of their being, which only God can fulfill, which is explained by the second chapter that we have been made for God, for relationship with God, for fellowship with God. And without God in our lives, we will never be complete. And our society as we look at it, is shooting itself in the foot. And we can see what is happening here. We can join the dots here. On the one hand, atheism is rising. And on on the other hand, at the very same time, the sense of hopelessness and meaninglessness and pointlessness in life is also rising. And those two things 
are connected because without God, we will never find purpose, meaning in our life. But if we are a Christian, are we living close to God? We've been made for God. Are we obeying His word? Are we mourning our failures? Are we believing His promises? Are we enjoying prayer with God? We are made for Him. Thomas Manton, I might have quoted this before, I'm not sure, but Thomas Manton uh, has this wonderful uh, passage uh, that, that he, he talks about prayer and he, he imagines God speaking to us and saying, it's great you come to me when you need something. You come to ask me. But, but Manton goes on imagining God saying, but when will you speak to me like a friend? When will you just talk to me? Times when you don't want anything from me. You don't need anything from me. We're made for God. For fellowship and communion. And that's where joy and fulfillment is found. So, our identity is defined in relation to God. Not by our color, white or black. Not by our class, lower, middle or upper. Not by our IQ, high or low. Not by our tax band. Our identity, our identity, and the identity of everyone in Newton Arts is in relation to God. Made by him. Made like him. Made for him. Looking for our identity and who we are and others will be unfulfilled. Do they need me? Do they like me? Do they want me? Do they care for me? We'll end up empty, disappointed. Only in God do we find our true identity made by him made like him, made for him. And because of sin, that identity is expanded in the Christian to the Lord Jesus, the Redeemer. And this is most liberating for us as we think of this this evening, that our identity is made by God, made for God, made like God, and in Jesus Christ being remade in the image of God by his grace, and salvation. For teenagers, your identity does not consist in the color of your hair or the shape of your body. It's in the fact that Jesus loves you, has died for you, has forgiven you. For adults, your identity is not the size of your bank balance, the size of your house, the size of your car, but that you are in Christ Jesus. For seniors, I don't know what to call the older people. Seniors, is that an acceptable one? Seniors, you know who that is. It's not where you go on holiday, where you eat lunch in the town, where you play your golf. It's that you're a saved man or woman. So what is your identity? How do you define yourself? Made by God. Made like God. Made for God. That's true of all of us. But we have to add that by faith in Jesus, we are saved by his grace.